guitar people, welcome to Have Guitar Will Travel presented by Vintage Guitar Magazine with your host, me, James Patrick Regan, otherwise known as Jimmy from the Deadlies. Today I'm speaking with Eugene Edwards, who's Dwight Yoakam's guitarist. We have a little trouble with Zoom, but nothing too bad. In our conversation, we cover tour logistics for the Dwight Yoakam tour. We dive deep into gear, amps, preamps, guitars, and pedals. We discuss trying to recreate the guitar tones on the albums, and we discuss Eugene's relationships with the previous guitarists in the band. Pete Anderson, Eddie Perez, who's in episode 65 of this podcast, and Keith Gaddis. Eugene replaced Eddie in two bands. Eugene takes us through his childhood in Yuma, Arizona, and tells us about his first concert, Bruce Springsteen, and learning guitar from the Alfred Method. We discuss how his high school country band led him to Los Angeles, a city Eugene loves. We talk about other bands Eugene has played with, including an Elvis impersonator, Scott Bruce, Sha Na Na, and Eugene's own band. We discuss the intricacies of Scotty Moore's playing. Eugene also talks about the Jaime suits he wears and playing in front of guitar legends. Eugene has a strong social media presence, but apart from that, you can find out more about him at the Dwight Yoakam website, dwightyoakam.com. That's D-Y-I-G-H-T-Y-O-A-K-A-M.com. On June 14th, if you're in Northern California, you can come check out my band, The Deadlies, at the Alameda County Fair. I'd love to see you, and come by and say hi. Please subscribe, like, comment, share, and most of all, review this podcast. I'd really appreciate it. And please support Vintage Guitar Magazine and all the wonderful things they do for us guitar players because they do so many wonderful things for us guitar players. Here's my buddy Eugene. You look very handsome there, sir. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. I take <laughs> interviews very seriously. Plus, I have to I have to run off as soon as we're done. As I said, I need to uh, actually pick up a new Strat from uh, uh, the repair shop that's getting set up, and, I, and then take it to the jet, and we play in Saratoga tonight. So, oh wow, it's kind of like it. it's a it's one of these days. Boom, 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 and then I'm glad we made it happen. Oh yeah, me too. Thank you very much for making it happen. I appreciate. You got it. it. It's, <laughs> where are you playing tomorrow night? I don't. I don't know. You don't know? I, I very rarely know. And I what, mean, I can look it up. What about Sunday night? I know where you're playing Sunday night. Uh, on Tomorrow night, we're playing in Reno. Okay. And then, yeah, on Sunday, we're playing the Blue Note in Napa. Do most of the guitar players you speak to do they know their itinerary that well? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, oh. the, none of them are, well, I shouldn't say none. Most of them are retired, and so to speak. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, okay. I got you. Or, or they're up and coming. And the up-and-comers, yes, they know their itinerary pretty well. Right, I got you. Yeah, um, I pe- see. People on your level, I don't get a, I don't get the opportunity to speak to very often. You know, um, there's a, it reminds me of a story that our drummer Mitch Marine tells. This was before I was with Dwight. Dwight was doing a bunch of shows, and, and, they, and Dwight and the band were hubbing out of a out of a certain hotel in a certain city. Uh-huh. And Mitch was down in the gym. And recognizes that Bruce Springsteen is also working in the gym with wow. a trainer, right? And there's no one else in the gym. It's just them. But Mitch doesn't say anything because he's working out. And then um, they get in the elevator. The 80s also enters the elevator. And this lady was someone that Mitch had met maybe a day before at the hotel. Casual conversation. Uh, Mitch told her he, he plays drums for Dwight Yoakam, and that's why he's there. So now in the elevator. And she says hi to Mitch. And she says, do you have a, a performance tonight? And Mitch says uh, yeah, he goes where, and then Miss just has this humble smile and just kind of shrugs, like I, I don't know. <laughs> and she goes, "Well, it kind of seems important that you need to know where to be." And then Bruce says, "Unannounced, hasn't been, hasn't said a word, hasn't been introduced." Just says, "Nah, he just needs to know what time to be in the lobby." <laughs> and Mitch just pointed at Bruce, like, <laughs> and 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 then Mitch says, "By the way, I couldn't have got higher word, like." You know, like how much more approval do you need, or, or like verification? If this guy, if that's the this guy, and clearly that's the answer. So that's usually how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> well, very good for you. I'm glad. I'm glad that you're at that level. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just we just plug and go. Yes, exactly. Well, you will be in Napa on, um, which is my backyard, in here on Sunday. So I'm. I, oh, I see. Yeah. That, that was why I brought it up. Damn it. And it, it was a long way to go for for that but it's uh that's interesting that when you so when you fly in to to set you so you're going to be you'll fly into saratoga will you are you going to sleep in your own bed tonight or are you going to sleep in a hotel somewhere in uh no i'll, I'll sleep in my own bed uh all, all weekend wow <laughs> although i don't normally go into details of our i don't normally go into the details of our itinerary too much yeah yeah that's fine the but that that is interesting that that you'll be able to sleep in your bed so you're going to fly in and out every day. Yeah, I think they call them runners. Okay, uh, we're going to pull a runner. I've, I've heard Paul McCartney say that, so I, that's why I like to say it. <laughs> so there's a crew that that goes up and brings your gear. Or you're not you're not using backline gear every every show, are you? No, we don't use backline. Okay, yeah, that's great. So 
That, that's fantastic. Just to get <laughs> right down to it, did, you're using, um, what are you using on stage as far as amps? A majority of the show, I'm going through a pair of uh, reissue deluxes, 1965 reissues. Okay. Um, there's also a 65 reissue of a Super Reverb. Those are the three amps that I'm going. Uh, the, the, the deluxes are used in parallel. Okay. Um, and the super I only use for a select song or two. Uh, we, essentially, we, we generally use on stage whatever was used in the studio. Wow. Now, that goes for songs that obviously that were recorded before I joined. Yeah, yeah. But it also goes for songs. Um, I'm trying to think. We just wrapped up a new album that will be coming out later in, in the fall. Okay. And now I'm trying to think about the different amps. I don't think I ever played through a Vox AC30 on any of the tracks this time around. But if I did and that song were in the show, we would have a Vox AC30. And we, you know, I'm always keeping notes on what ends up getting used when we're in the studio because I have to remember to recall it and say, okay, this is what we did. This is what we have to do live. Yeah. Um, now, the deluxes, uh, and this is... Uh, Pete Anderson has spoke about this in interviews before. The deluxes are modified slightly uh, in conjunction with the the Telecasters that I'm using, which have a preamp in them, a little oh, wow. bit of a boost, um, and so so it's kind of sent the, the guitar is sending a lot of Signal. power, yeah. a lot of information to the front of the amp, um, and uh, I actually tracked down the gentleman who did Pete's original work. We we found the guy and. We had him install the preamps, and he kind of made sure the answer. So we're always, I'm going for as accurate as I can. Obviously, at some point, you're not the same person who played on the original <laughs> exactly. songs. So it, it, things will, things will fall into just. There's the person who came up with the part, who innovated the part, and and the way they hold the. You know, there's certain things we can't completely replicate, but if we can get really close, then um, you know the idea is that when the audience hears the introduction to guitars Cadillacs or Fast As You, these iconic sure. guitar intros that hopefully we were able to conjure the memory of the record as fast as, you know, as, as accurately as possible. Uh, it's out of respect for that catalog. I grew up learning that stuff as a kid in his bedroom when it, as those records came out. Sure. Um, so I have a reverence for that stuff. Um, there, yeah, right now that's pretty much what's going on amp wise for me. Okay, and have you had an opportunity to speak with um, with Pete, like in any great detail? Not not since not since I've joined Dwight. I actually met Pete. Gosh, it must have been in the late nineties uh, or so. Uh, he he was very. I met him before I, long before I met Dwight, uh, and Pete was really generous to me. He was very sweet. Um, he actually produced uh, a song uh, of mine. He he uh, and and put it on a compilation record he had uh, coming out with a bunch of unsigned artists. And I don't know. Yeah, he just he took a liking to to a song I had and um, rearranged it and it just him just produced it. It was I mean I just it all happened so fast I just yeah. couldn't believe it. it. Was like wow we okay there's Pete Anderson <laughs> um, and then it and then it was but the the way I ended up joining Dwight was was devoid of it was separate from from that it didn't have anything to do with that that experience and, and how, did, how i mean as long as really. you brought it up how did you it's, end up it happened through a different channel <laughs> yeah how, but no i haven't i think I've, I've seen pete maybe oh so how i got the how i got the gig a friend of mine uh, named brian whelan who's a very very talented musician sure uh, i uh, i had met him gosh back in like 2004 or so 2003 or four and um and Brian had played in my band quite a bit that I had, and we just did tons of gigs together because mm -hmm. Brian can play a lot of instruments, and he's a very valuable player. Uh, and then he eventually uh, joined Dwight's band because um, uh, the uh, piano pedal steel slot had opened up, and sure. he got drafted into there. And um, about an, a year later, um, the guitar player that had been with Dwight for about five five to seven years, I think, five years or so, uh, was leaving, uh, and uh, and Brian told Dwight about me. Along the lines of speaking with Pete, did you ever speak with Eddie? Yes. Um, now, oddly enough, I had met Eddie back in the earlier, mid, no, the mid-1990s. Okay. Um, in the rock, through the rockabilly scene of L.A. and San Diego that was happening at the time. Uh, in fact, in night, uh, he was playing in a rockabilly trio called Russell Scott and his Red Hots. And I really, really love that band. Russell played upright bass and he sings, and it's just this incredible voice, and they had this great, great material. 
and I would see them as often as I could at the time. And uh, and for a while, Eddie was their guitar player. And and then in 1996, Eddie left that band, and uh, I got a call. Which in the 90s, that was it, people may forget it was it, it was hard to get a hold of people, especially musicians, getting a hold of each other. A phone number didn't mean anything, especially if you're on the road. It was like, oh, I got his, I think I have his mom's number. It just took a while to track someone down. Sure, sure. So, but they finally tracked me down. And I moved to Los Angeles in July of 1996 to uh, take a guitar spot that Eddie had left. And then I guess maybe like something like 17 years later, Eddie left Dwight's band to go back with the Mavericks. And then I get this call to yet again occupy a spot that Eddie had vacated. I did get to speak to Eddie once before my first show with Dwight, um, I went to a Dwight concert uh, and Eddie was obviously was, was still playing with him. And um, and so Eddie just, yeah, he gave me a, a few bits of advice, which was really more more philosophical than anything. It wasn't really much technical advice. He says, you know, the parts are the parts and you're going to be fine. Yeah. Um, he said, but in terms of approach, you know, he just here's my approach. And, uh, you know, and and it was just it was just really, really, really helpful to to get that sort of um we have to call it wisdom because he'd, he'd been through the experience of, of being Dwight Yoakam's lead guitar player. Um, and then I think a lot in the first few first month or so, a couple of months, I think some of the audience just thought Eddie had, had cut his hair uh, <laughs> <laughs> from a distance. You know? um, and, and, and then now what's great is, is um, last fall we did a handful of shows with the Mac. Mavericks. Okay. And then we're doing about 20 shows this summer and hopefully even more next summer. And so now I get to see Eddie. I'll get to see Eddie on a more regular basis, which yeah. is really, really fun. It's a lot of fun. You know? Sure, sure. Uh, I know. And then, he's a real character. <laughs> yeah. Along the lines, also a very sharp dresser like yourself. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, we, we, we kind of like to uh, uh, present well, you yes, know. Exactly. Um, did you ever get a chance to meet Keith Gaddis? Ooh, yes, uh, once or twice. Uh, I, I did. For, uh, I'm, I'm thinking it was around 2014, fall of 2014. I feel like we played a show in Tennessee. I tend to think it was when we were on this tour with Eric Church, and, and uh, that's that's the way I remember it because his his baby was quite young. He was a baby. Right. Um, I mean, was, yeah, and so, but I never really got to talk shop with him a whole lot because uh, it, he was catching up with the other guys of the band and crew that with whom he'd spent years yeah, you know yeah. uh and it's funny to meet a guy like like you know learning his parts like this like the song blame the vein we do sure. regularly and and um you know I, I i guess i guess i felt like i i got to know him that way mm -hmm. but not through per, not personally knowing him just kind of hearing what he would tend to do and listening to like board recordings of those shows and, or going on YouTube and just seeing what, how he played something a little differently, what his angle was. You know, I think you, know, you described Gaddis's thing, something that Gaddis actually did share in common with Pete stylistically what, is there's almost, is he going to get out of this solo? Like, is, is he going to land this plane? There's a bit of a wobbly, unpredictable kind of tension, almost like just, they're right on the edge of the whole thing just falling apart. And then, of course, the, the release of that tension is at the last second you save it. Sure. And that's just kind of that high wire act. Even though they, you wouldn't confuse the two uh, necessarily if you heard you know, them playing. But that aspect, that approach, I thought, which is really valuable, especially when you're playing you know, with Dwight, his catalog, there's certain songs, you know, the, the big hits we're gonna play them every night yeah, yeah. and i've been asked do you get tired of it or how do you play the same thing every night and and it's well obviously it's not difficult at all i think if you're if you were a broadway actor you'd you'd have to say the same words every night um now some inflections may change some of the nuances may change uh and sometimes if, if so you just have to practice being in the moment because that way the solo to like the second solo to guitars cadillacs there's this you have to truly give this unpredictable factor has to be in it yeah that's what makes it fun that's why it never gets monotonous because i honestly i'm trying to think of, i'm i may not get out of this one that's <laughs> real <laughs> no that's great i, I wish you and i i think there's a couple other guitar players that only played for a short amount of time with dwight but i we don't need to get into those <laughs> whether or not you met them well no so that would be so um that would be uh a, a shaver yeah. uh eddie 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 uh, of course, I didn't. You know, he passed away long before I could meet him. Um, did Dwayne Jarvis maybe do some 
way back in the day yeah, I don't when know. Pete was still Pete was pretty, he may have filled in on some things for a tour here or there. I did meet Dwayne Jarvis before he passed, but but uh, not in the context. I I but I wasn't in Dwight's band yet or not. So no, um, so no, I've been yeah. And I guess you know really, I mean, in general, I suppose it's only been maybe four. I mean, really think just Pete, Keith, Eddie, and me. Uh, yeah. So I think we, we kind of cover the the, the bulk the, of it. You know, the bulk of it, yeah. Gro- we're growing up. Did you? Where did you grow up? Were your parents musical as well? Uh, I grew up in Yuma, Arizona. Uh, south. It was the most southwestern corner of the state. Uh, my father, as a teenager, was a drummer. Okay. Um, and so and and so there were a lot of. But he, you know, he didn't really pursue it. Um, probably because I came along uh, yeah. quite unexpectedly. Uh, there was a sonar, uh, a sonar kit, so not sonar, sonar kit in the house when I was a kid for a while. That uh, there's a pictures of me like a Kiss T-shirt, you know, taking a crack at it. Um, but I was definitely drawn to the guitar early on. My dad had a great record collection, uh, which which he allowed me to take when I when I uh, left for college, and I still have it. Wow. And um, uh, but but you no, know, we, we were it was definitely music was a huge part of it. It was always played in the house when I grew up. Um, I think they, I was a really, really shy little boy, painfully shy. Uh, and um, they, but they noticed that music, I kind of got a little animated around music. And so they took me to my first concert when I was seven. Wow. And then it was, it was just all over. Okay. It was, there was just no, I was seven years old. I knew, I knew, I knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. I didn't know how I'd get there, but the what was just completely it was a no-brainer for me, you know. What was the first concert? Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, wow. November fifth, nineteen eighty, on the River Tour. Which, if you buy the the box set reissue of the River album, there's a Blu-ray DVD of that show. Wow! Um, so it's my first, you know, and it was such a huge memory, strong, strong memory of of mine growing up as a kid. I mean, I, I replayed this thing in my mind. But I was just obsessed with it. And then to find out years later, oh, hey, look, there's it's some Blu-ray. You want to see it? And I bought it right away. But then it sat on my shelf for months, mm-hmm. months, because I was thinking, do you do you do this? Do you what if you undo? What if it wasn't as good as you? I mean, yeah. you know, you, do you want to run this risk? Um, that's why I think like, uh, you know, in the rules of fiction, you can go back in time, but you're not allowed to change anything. Yeah. I think that's just the way we would describe video. So I can go back, but I can't. So, so I, I did. I jumped in the time machine. I went back to the ASU Activity Center uh, and, and watched it. And it was, I actually was shocked how much I remembered very, very clearly. Uh, it worked out. It worked out. Did you play guitar? Like, did you start learning right away after that? Or was it? Not so much right away. Um, but my, my father a guitar for me around my neck by the time I was eight. And she never put it down. But I really didn't take lessons until um, I was 12 years old. My you know, junior high offered guitar 101, basically. And I took two years. And working out of Alfred's Basic Guitar Method, number one. Still one of the best books. Bit, like, you know, it's just still one of the best things you can get. And the back, and the back cover. Sorry, my dog just kind of curled up right next up. to me. Uh, the back cover on the inside of it had this big chord chart, right? The, all the window shapes. And, and I just ripped that off and I nailed it to the inside of my bedroom door. And it stayed there for years. Wow. You know. I couldn't. I couldn't describe to you where a diminished chord fit anywhere, but I knew I could make that shape and play it. I just didn't know where to put it. Yeah, very good. <laughs> That's great. But yeah, so I was pretty autodidactic for for quite a while there. Yeah. <laughs> what was your first guitar? When you that the one your dad bought you for? It, the, the first one he got for me was uh, an applause yep. by Ovation. So sure. not even a full on Ovation fi- fiberglass acoustic. It was an applause. The student model. Yeah. It, was, it was bigger than me, man. I still have it. It's in the garage. Do you right really? Now, yeah. Right on. Yeah. 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 I had, uh, and, um, you know, I think it was one of those things like, well, if he, we'll see if he sticks with it. It's one of the, I think it was one of those guitars. It was one of those, if he's really into it. And then, and then, um, when I was 13, graduating from eighth grade, going into high school, we, uh, we took a trip up to Phoenix and he surprised me. We went to a shop called Bizarre Guitar. Sure. Just still there in Phoenix. It's a different location than it was. Of course, this is, you know, late 80s. Yeah. And uh, we walked into a and he says, and uh, it was time to move to electric guitar. He says, pick one. And in fact, uh, <laughs> but this is it. Wow. This is the guitar. It's an 86 Fender Squire. Yeah. Made in Japan. Wow. Uh, Telecaster. Now, since then, I've, I've put little, I put, this is the Firebird uh, humbucker here, Firebird and I can, humbucker. and probably a Rio, getting, getting redundant, having tons of tellies around. But 
Um, Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I picked that. That was that's the this is the first electric guitar, and it still plays great. As I learned all my Zeppelin stuff and oh, yeah. uh, on that guitar, and it, and of course you know the, that neck. It's so funny. My hand has got to be twice the size it was when I was thirteen, but that neck still feels perfect to me. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And it looks great. It looks like it doesn't look uh, beat up. Like uh, what's the back of it like? Isn't it enough? Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, I I took this thing on the playing in a country band and. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's not. It's not. I mean, the back of it probably has some belt wear, but it's. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's about it. Um, were you listening? So you, uh, your first band was that first concert was Bruce Springsteen. But were you listening to country music at at that time, or or not so much? No, no. You know what? Up until the Bruce concert, I I have a, a couple of older cousins, and um, you know, that's always like an untold, not the untold story, but it's a, you'll find that there's always like an older sibling or an older cousin, someone who's turning you on to sure. And they were listening to Kiss and Cheap Trick and uh, ACDC Back in Black album was huge. Um, it was like a lot. And so I was just kind of like, in, in fact, the first album I, you know, going album shopping with my dad, uh, the first one I, I was allowed to pick out myself. Uh, and then uh, the one I chose was Kiss Alive, the first Kiss Alive, the double album. Wow. And um, anyway, so, but then after, but you know, also but the Beatles were already happening. And you know, what was big was Buddy Holly because the Buddy Holly story was running on oh, HBO. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I could like, you know, as historically inaccurate as that movie is, and it is way off. Yeah. But but I, I forgive it because those those three actors are actually performing and singing and playing in the movie. Yeah. They're playing live. And so with the movie, I would say the one thing the movie got right was just the excitement of rock of early rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Just the way a small combo can change the feel of a room just with sheer rhythm and harmony yeah. and um so 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 i was listening so i was i was pretty into buddy holly and the early beatles made sense to me obviously but then after the bruce concert yeah my taste like i just stopped i pretty much stopped listening to kiss and 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 that so i just kind of it just went closer to um yeah i would say and and then elvis presley i i took i started to take his stuff more seriously especially the early things and that was actually i would say that was how i started that was my exposure to, to country music it was more or less through rockabilly okay because that's the exciting guitar that's the fun guitar stuff to learn how to play oh yeah and and so but then you know a lot of rockabilly songs would be just revved up versions of an older country song yeah so i was learning the ch the chord changes to a lot of classic country stuff. I mean, old honky tonk stuff, and learning how to play sw in, in a swing rhythm, you know, um, via rockabilly. Yep. Uh, and then uh, by the time I was in high school, uh, yeah, it was sort of in Yuma, especially if you wanted to, you know, make a buck playing guitar, you're probably going to be in a country band, right. and that's what happened. It was a, a band, you know, played six nights a week, five sets a night, sort of stuff. Right the, on. The ten thousand hours begin, yeah. and we were doing like, Dwight. We were doing a lot of Dwight stuff. It was you know we we would the the band was called Fast Gun, and and I was a kid. I mean everyone else was like ten years older than me. Uh, I wasn't legally allowed to really even be in the clubs, um, you know. But I was a teetotaler. I, I didn't. I wasn't going to push the rules anyway. And but still, most of the time, technically, and we in other states too, I wasn't allowed to leave the stage. So even if we took a break, I had to stay on stage, and I would just bring a book. And read. I mean, it was just completely <laughs> social. I was just, I wasn't really properly socialized ever, really, to be honest. <laughs> How do you make that transition from playing in that, in that band to coming to LA? Well, well, so the linchpin moment, we, st that band started playing San Diego quite a bit. Okay. And on a night off, um, I saw a rockabilly trio, uh, called Hot Rod Lincoln. And, um, it, I, I introduced myself to them. I loved what they were doing. And they were really kind. And, and again, I still wasn't old enough to get in the club. So I, if they were playing somewhere that was all ages or something like that, or I, I would, I would just go see them all the time. I became really close with with their guitar player Buzz Campbell, who's now with Lee Rocker and and uh, has his own projects going on. <laughs> so we, he and I go way way back. But um, and then through Buzz, he introduced me to the rest of the rockabilly scene and roots music scene that was happening at that time. And uh, this is in the 90s. So the swing scare, if you will, <laughs> was huge, you know, and, and that's how I found uh, I, you know, eventually found about heard Russell Scott and loved that band. And as soon as there was an opening, I, 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 I grabbed it. And then that was that facilitated my move up to Los Angeles. Uh -huh. 
and, and, and I've been here ever since. Yeah. Were, were, were you looking for a way to get to Los Angeles? Was it was that your goal? You know, no. Oddly enough, I was looking for a way out of Yuma. To oh, be okay. really, really honest. Um, okay. Now, I had uh, right after high school, I did go to Berkeley College of Music for just a semester. Uh, for, uh, just well, and I would have stayed. Just, it was extraneous circumstances back home, f- kind of forced me to have to come back. Okay. Um, and and that country band that I had played with in high school, they had not replaced me yet because I hadn't been gone that long. And then I came back, and 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 they were hitting the road, so that that was fine for me for a while. Um, but uh, I guess maybe had that band relocated maybe to Nashville would have made more sense. Um, that would have been fine with me. I, it's not like I ever had a, dr- a goal of living in Los Angeles. I just like any of the big cities, New York, Nashville, wherever you could make a full time living as a musician on a national stage would have been ultimately the goal, I think. Sure. Um, it just saying yes to things led me to Los Angeles. And now, of course, I'm completely grateful that I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere. Uh-huh. I don't plan on moving. Um, you know, I, uh, I've had, you know, a 20 year marriage here. I have a, I have a, a, a wonderful 16 year old daughter and my wow. home is here. And, and so I'm very comfortable here. I, lo- I just love Los Angeles. Yeah. It suits me really, really well. Uh, what about the traffic? What about the traffic? Atlanta has traffic. DC has, everyone has traffic. Yeah. You've been to Austin lately? Uh, no, I haven't. Yeah, traffic. <laughs> yeah. By the way, you know, an, an economist would tell you that that dense traffic is a good sign. That means that's a healthy economy. That's so. I just take it in stride. You build. You just build it into your existence. You you just okay. It's going to take this long to get there, and okay, so that's more time to chat with your kid or listen to listen to music. You know, yeah. you can do. It's not the worst. It's uh, not the worst thing. Scott Bruce. Tell me about Scott Bruce. Scott Bruce. Well, okay. So, okay. Here's a, this is a great story. If you have a minute. I do. I, I guess that's the whole point is to tell stories. All right. That's yes, an audio. Exactly. Format. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> okay. So I'm still in fast gun at the time. I'm 19 years old and the band fast gun was nominated for some California country music. So, so the CCMAs, right? It was like the state chapter of the CMAs. Okay. And we were nominated for some awards. And so they had this show, this award show at a big country bar somewhere in the San Gabriel Valley. I can't remember the name of the bar. Great house band. And the, and um, it was such an odd move because halfway through the thing, this Elvis impersonator did uh, like one song. I was thinking, it's an, it was good. Young Elvis did Blue Suede Shoes, great energy, sang, sang perfectly. But everything I was thinking, it's an audience full of musicians. Anyway, he was great. Anyway, so let's say that was like in August uh, or so. Then that December, in fact, that New Year's Eve, we uh, our, our house gig in Yuma, they still wanted us to play on December 24th. So we just thought, oh, this is a drag. Yeah. So in protest, we wore pajamas because we figured we'll probably play two sets, 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock. No one's going to be there, and he'll send us home. And... Of course, at 10 o'clock, the place gets jam-packed. It is filled to the gills, man. And we're in pajamas. So, uh, And then I see the Elvis guy. <laughs> I see him in the, at the, in the club. Thinking, that's him. That's the, that's the guy. I, was like, I, I told the band, told him, that's, the, uh, that's the L.A. Elvis guy. Man, look at him. So I went on a break. I went up to him, introduced myself. He says, hey, you guys sound fantastic. I said, thank you so much. I said, oddly enough, I know who you are. I don't know what you're doing in Yuma on Christmas Eve. So and uh, he and I had him come up. We did a, a couple of numbers with us. It was great, right? Uh-huh. And someone just unearthed some photographs of him on stage with us that night. Wow. Anyway, um, you know, a, a college buddy of his uh, had some property in Yuma. Uh, Scott had some gigs. Instead of flying back home to Washington State to see his folks, he had to kind of stick around, and he was going to spend Christmas alone in L.A. And his buddy said, "You know what?" It's just like a four and a half hour drive. Just come out to Yuma, spend it with us, da da da. And so that's what he was doing, doing in Yuma that night. Well, he was in town for a couple of days. So I'm assuming on the 26th, I, I we went out and met for a burger um, that lasted six hours. He was a big Springsteen fan. We loved the Smithereens. Oh, wow. We love Elvis Costello. We loved all this old rock and roll stuff. And um, and it's just started a friendship that goes to this day. I mean, if I'm available, I still play with Scott Bruce. Because I just I love him and I love that I love Elvis's material so much. Oh, of course, it's great. It's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Scott, Scotty Morlicks and stuff. Was, uh, that's the good stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a good discipline. You know, it's funny because um, um, I guess at the time I knew them, I thought I knew them well. But then, as you know, if you start doing a deep dive on stuff, and now we're in an era of tribute bands, and this is like a whole new, it's not just a new economy, but I would say it's a whole new world of, of studying as a guitarist. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, she's filling in for someone. I, there's an all-female Led Zeppelin tribute group. Sure. And um, so, and so, a friend of mine, she's she's subbing for the lead guitar player, and and she just said, "This is just so much stuff. It is just so much studying." Oh yeah. Um, and the same, and and so with this Elvis thing, you know, it was like, um, I, I should be using a guitar with flat wounds. I'm not, but I have to pretend. You so you sort of like have to make these tone compensations. You have to understand that in the early days, Scotty was not. He wasn't like he was the best guitar player in Memphis at the time. It was just he was someone who was young, you know, pretty good. Yeah. Sam Phillips puts him with Elvis and says, see what you guys can come up with. So he, when he comes back, he can record something. You know, I, I mean, and before you know it, in a, in a couple of years, Scott, he's just in the he's in the hottest act. No. So. It, um, so, yeah, but learning certain certain sixth voicings, there's a chord that he plays in. Elvis's blue suede shoes, there's an A major chord. It took me. Like uh, the bad part of 15 years to finally track down exactly how he's playing this voicing. Uh, I mean, it's pretty much an add to, but it's it's where he places it is just so unusual. And uh, I never I, I felt like a fraud until I found that voicing. And there's so many <laughs> things, you know, or just the, the timing, just the sheer rhythm of playing the solo to Money Honey is something that eludes me from night to night. And sometimes <laughs> If you lock in and you, you you nail it with the rhythm section, it's like it's like the sweet spot of a bat. And then some nights it just kind of doesn't swing the right way. And <laughs> you know, you're it's lightning in a bottle. It's lightning in a bottle. <laughs> and and uh, in the mix of all this, w when did you start doing your own stuff, or, or were you always doing your own stuff? No, no, no. I, it was uh, uh, by around 1999 or 2000. I left Russell's band. I started to writing. I start, started writing my material. Um, and, uh, so the Eugene Edwards band, cause I couldn't think of another name <laughs> clearly, um, sort of developed, there it was just a, a venue for me to play original tunes uh, that I was writing. Um, and, and they weren't rockabilly songs in any way. They were really very influenced by Nick Lowe and squeeze and Elvis Costello. So that sort of rock sure. pop kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and then we, yeah, we just got really, really busy over the years. We played Los Angeles. I, Brian Whelan was in the band. He did a calculation one year of how many nights we played, and it it was kind of exorbitant. Now, here's the thing: this was before uh, cell phones had video cameras. This was before all that, so most of this stuff is there's no evidence of us. It's just all legend now. Which <laughs> this, so, uh, we would play these really long, sweaty nights, and, and people would come back. Oh, that was amazing! Uh, I say, yeah, it, it was, but it's like Bigfoot. It's just you know, you just it's just going to be a story here on that. But uh, we had a great time, Bye. and and then and then you know did that for years. But I'm sorry, but did that for years. But then it just you know, never really caught on. It never got the big deal. Da da da. That's fine. And I had I started getting other. T I I've got put on a morning radio show, and I worked for a film composer, and just other gigs started coming along, and it just sort of and and honestly, uh, to be very honest, I didn't have the uh, the push to write just wasn't there anymore uh for whatever reason i just you know so i just thought oh i don't have anything to write right now i'll just go out and do something else yeah so i'm that, sorry you're gonna ask oh it's quite all right i was gonna ask you a whole bunch of things you mentioned doing soundtrack work to anything that we we would have heard so what uh, actually i worked with a buddy of mine with whom i'd gone to high school back in yuma tim jones he's a couple years older than me but he relocated to la to be a film composer okay and um, the years I worked with him, uh, he was scoring for an NBC show called Chuck, which was like a sure. comedy action spy sort of thing, which is a tremendous show because um, for him to score, obviously, it's a, it's a show on NBC. Um, so and it was every episode was an hour. And so I really learned the hard way about different. You know, that's a really different world there because, um, you know, we, we could write a song, a pop song with a, a verse, a chorus, and a middle eight. And you repeat some of those things in like two and two and a half minutes go by like that. Yeah. But in scoring, you're not repeat you're not repeating a chorus as those things. So a 42 second cue feels like eternity. <laughs> you know, and um and um it's it, I learned I had to 
not relearn music, but I would approach music from a very different way. He would just put an instrument in my hand, okay, and 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 said, just come up with something for this. And he put, and I said, well, what key are we in? He said, I don't know, because he's not thinking in keys. It's just you know sometimes you have to almost think more in modes or think I don't know. Or you, it's two in the morning, and the and the music editor says, hey, the producer says he wants the bass to be a little more purple, and you, and your job is to make that happen. Sure. Um, so it's funny, uh, not to name drop, but, uh, uh Marvin Hamlish, uh, who, I, oh, I pl- also played for years with Sean on somewhere in the, all of this before oh, I got really? into white. Oh yeah. And, and we would do these shows, these symphony shows and we would, and Marvin Hamlish would be with us. And so I got all this crazy amount of downtime with him before he passed away. Wow. And we were talking about a movie. I think black Swan was out and, and he says, great, good movie, but boy, that score is a little over the top. It, like, that is the most dramatic Diet Coke in the history of film. <laughs> and he says, uh, and then we were, ta- and we were talking about scoring. And he says, yes, yeah, so the frustrating thing is you, you're communicating with the, the movie studio, and then they put you on the phone with the music department. He says, by the way, they got to rename this. Nobody who answers the phone knows bass clef, treble clef. I don't know why they're called this. He goes, I can't ha- I've never had a musical discussion with these people. He was very, very funny about it. But, you know, that's a, but as Tim taught me, about when when the whether it's the music editor or the whoever it is, they give you notes. They're always right. Oh yeah, they're always right. Yeah. <laughs> or as, or as I, Henry Mancini had said, "Don't fall in love with a single note that you write. You've got to be willing to just trash." It. And that was like a really really great experience, you know. Oh, for sure. I can only imagine. Mm-hmm. How long did you play with Sean Anna? This is a this is big news. Oh oh gosh, uh, you know uh, now that started uh, my friend Buzz. From Hot Rod Lincoln, uh-huh. had uh, he had taken the Shanana guitar spot somewhere in the late '90s, if I remember. Um, yeah, yeah, no, around 2000, 2001, he must have taken that s- spot. And when he did, he said, hey, I, "You know, he said I, I got, I'm playing guitar with Shanana now." I said, "Wow, that's amazing." And he says, "But I still have these other gigs. So in the case of having a conflict, I'd really love it if you were my sub. I trust you with the gig." Okay, and then so I subbed a few times, two thousand two, two thousand three, sort of like. But then, I, then I think Buzz got the opportunity to, to join Lee Rocker's band full time. Okay, and so then I just sort of feathered. They just feathered me in to being in the band. Uh, I might, I'm, I'm. It, I think I may have. Yeah, mm. I'm trying to think. I have to gauge this by my by when my daughter was born. So okay. I think I started playing with them more solidly around two thousand five, two thousand six. And then essentially had to uh, leave when I joined Dwight. There was okay. just no way I could do the two at the same time. So, okay. um, so yeah, so a good, you know, a good handful of years. And that was an incredible thing. They they've closed up shop now. Sean and I, they finally retired. Uh-huh. But it was like being around like rock and roll Forrest Gumps. Oh yeah. They played they played Woodstock yeah, right before absolutely. Jimi Hendrix. Exactly. They played the Fillmore East, and they did all those those rock places you would have done. Yeah. Um, and then they were in the movie Grease. Yeah, uh, they had a network variety show. I, like I, I they used just to watch it religiously. Oh no, <laughs> that was the first time the Ramones were on national television. Was yeah. on their show. You know, I remember seeing the Runaways uh, for the first time. On uh, I was a little, but uh, yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. so. Um, but you know, they also they played. Uh, John Lennon did the benefit show at Madison Square Garden in yep. the early seventies. It was John Lennon, Stevie Wonder, and Sean Anna. Wow. I didn't know. Th- I was on the road with them. I think it was in my hotel room reading a copy of Mojo magazine and read about the, and read the full thing. And then I go down to Kate was holding it up. Was someone going to tell me you guys played a show with John Lennon? <laughs> was was Bowser yeah. still part of the of the act at that point? No, he was he was gone by then. I think when they uh, when the TV show wrapped up, you know, they had a couple of semis worth. And, you know, that was a, if you were on television, you were nationally famous. That was it. Oh, right? yeah. There's only three channels. It, it, so you're, you're playing basketball arenas just because you have a TV show. And so the rest of the guys, well, then let's just go back on the road. And Bows, John Bauman is really, you know, he comes from more of a theater background. I believe he went to Juilliard. If I'm, wow. I, 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 Hopefully I don't get his biography wrong here. And he was getting acting opportunities and things. So he, you know, you get a callback, you get auditions, you can't be in Minnesota. So he just, so they just, he's, I'll stay home guys, you know, do, um, and, uh, uh, in fact, I've, yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, I'm. Too, it was. It was Scotty, Scott Simon, Jocko, Donnie, um, Lenny had retired in 2000. But I did. He. But whenever we played around Boston or so, 
Lenny would sit in and play with us. It was great. Um, yeah, it was just a tremendous experience. I mean, those guys just met everybody. They had the best stories, just the best showbiz uh, yeah. stories. <laughs> yeah, it sounds incredible. Yeah, good for me too because they speak from an East Coast theater background, so the vernacular was different. I'm, I'm at this point, I'm a club musician, you know, and they would speak in terms of upstage, downstage. Um, you, you know, they really. I learned a lot. Sometimes you just realize, that, you know, there's three dancers. They move, they move stage left. It's like you know, and I knew, oh, I should just move down and occupy their space. You're learning how to like occupy negative space, yeah. change the look of a thing, go up on that riser for this song, come down here. Okay, I you know, and I learned how to you know be in the lobby on time. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, all, all the things that really, really make you extremely employable in this life. Sure. Uh, I, and I tell I I speak if I tell any students or if I'm speaking at a music school or, or things, I, I I will reiterate and and you've probably heard this on your on your show as well, but you know these gigs that are out there, the vast majority of them don't require you to play like Mahavishnu or like. You know, like it's it's not requiring like intense and crazy chops. It's good to have them and not need them. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. But it's really like, can I live with you for two weeks on a bus? Sure. Yeah. You know, are and um, it's the hang, and it's can I count on you? Will you be accountable? You know, um, those are these are the things that really make the big big difference. It's like, look, you will learn the chops. You'll work on it. You'll woodshed on it. You, you, you know, you'll get. But the other, the life skills stuff, you know, the uh, not the IQ, but the EQ, if you will, like that's, that's <laughs> like they don't have they don't have time to teach that. You got to have that together, you know. <laughs> exactly. Did you get used to wearing gold lame? And uh, did you did they ever? Well, I didn't have to wear. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to wear the gold lame. So no, um, uh, no, uh, and uh, I. Uh, yeah, I had to figure out how to do my hair a little differently at the time. I had it in a shag cut, and so then I would just sweep it up and make something happen. Who knows? Yeah. Um, no, I think they, they'd had a bowling shirt from a team in, if I remember, it was uh, Eagle, Colorado. I'm trying to remember the name. Anyway, it just a Gino on it. It was a bowling shirt with Gino embroidered that, some, <laughs> that someone had bought in a thrift store and threw in a trunk, and it fit me. There's a here you go, your Gino now. That oh, this is easy. Okay, great. There you go. <laughs> right on. That's great. So I learned how to learn wear the same thing on stage every night. Before I joined Dwight, I was doing that already in Sean and On. I learned the value of that too. It's less thinking. <laughs> do you only have the one jacket from Jaime or do you have more? Well, I go through them uh pretty savagely, it oh, turns out. Right. Okay. I'm well, yeah, I'm 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 pretty hard on them. So um, I'd say uh, we, a new one has to be made. I guess I'm averaging every four to five years. Jaime has to make another one from scratch. And we hold on to the old ones just in case. Uh -huh. But they're pretty shredded. I mean, during the show, I'll see the, the, the sequin just flying off in the <laughs> distance. You know, um, and, and yeah, holes just... They're not built for some to do wind, windmills and some of the stuff I do. But yeah. I just, I kind of get excited and, and then... Uh, yeah, buttons just fly everywhere and and it's just triage at that point yeah <laughs> and we send it back to jaime can you patch this can you fix this and then at some point he says i, I cannot fix it no more you got any <laughs> okay, okay jaime but jaime's the best though oh he's incredible oh it's just a joy to be there um yeah i i it's just it always it feels like a treat you know because he was an apprentice to nudie i mean he knew these he knew those greats directly you know oh, and yeah. and I've, I've met manuel when i'm in nashville i'll see manuel too but i've never worn a manuel um but he, he's a fascinating he's just, oh, talk about a great storyteller sure um and then jaime is just very quiet and doesn't doesn't speak about himself and of course and of course manuel is a complete opposite oh, you yeah. know yeah uh, so, but it's it's great to know both of them, oh, and it's in yeah. Jaime's shop is it's in North Hollywood on Lancashire, not far from where well Nudie's original shop was, but also a lot of the a lot of that a lot of those costumers were right around there. So it's kind of nice that Jaime is still there physically where he is, and, and and when he goes, you know that part of Los Angeles's music history will uh, sadly go you know go go with him. Oh yeah, I, I hope that day never comes. But but if if you look at I it's I believe it's the the country music hall of fame website 
has a page specifically about country western stage wear and Turk and nudie and and the people who originally made those things and the, and Jaime has his own page and Manuel has his own page. What's great is then there's a, there's a page of all these young these new people, new designers. There's a woman in Austin who does a great job. So sure. there are uh, you know um, things. In fact, I. Uh, we just did a show with Amanda Pearl. Uh, you know, um, I think she was wearing her whole suit. I think it was Jaime. In fact, wow. I think it was Jaime, not Manuel. So, so we still come across people who's you know, obviously Billy Gibb is, in, is still wearing his stuff. And, oh yeah, and Chris Isaac, Marty Stewart has pretty much everything. Yes, exactly. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> but like Dwight says, you know, like we're just kind of one of the last bands to hold that tradition up. You know, yeah, that's fantastic. Be- yeah. W- before we run out of time, I got to ask you about your guitars and your guitar collection. Uh, how many guitars do you have? Okay, so uh, no, to me, no. There's two. We, we could be talking about two different things here. Everything I play on the Dwight gig is Dwight's. Okay, um, which is you know great. He just uh, he supplies, and I I beat the heck out of it, and then I walk away, and it's the dream. So my personal gear, uh, there's a lot. Let's see, on the road, though, on stage, you, we generally have a backup for everything. There's really. Um, the, the main guitar, what I call the number one telly, is a custom shop reissue of a 63. Uh-huh. Um, uh, all the telly, everything has a rosewood fretboard. Yeah. Um, so there's that. And then we had the custom shop make a double of it. Uh, thank God, you know, Fender has paperwork for everything. So we just, I took the spec sheet and we just said, do this again. Yeah. There's also, and then there's a, an American original, American vintage original, all in white. That's also just a backup, just a, you know, a concert uh, tune backup telly there's a, a red epiphone dwight trash sure. casino yeah. that i use which is great so that's essentially a casino with a reverse firebird head uh headstock and neck in through it so it's got a slightly darker sound because of that neck going through um and that's what gets run through the super reverb uh, what else um there's also been uh a, just a telly with a bigsby on it uh-huh. um but that is gonna that's gonna get retired here because tonight for the first night I'm gonna be playing a strat uh, on some of the songs Pete played a strat yeah. uh, middle pickup only and so uh, right when we're done here I said I'm gonna run to the shop yeah. it's getting set up now I'm gonna grab it take it with me and so tonight's the inaugural strat night so there'll be some strats in the show and it's an early '60s uh, uh, custom shop reissue um, with Texas specials in them okay. that was a thing I. We were A, being some guitars, and I put this one in the middle position and played the opening lick to Fast As You, and Dwight and I looked at each other. Like, yep. All right. That. Yep. There you go. So and, so we'll see how that goes. We're working the strats into the mix there. What is the... Oh, go ahead. James. Yes. I'm so sorry, but the guitar I get asked about the most yeah. is the B-Bender. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and it's, again, it's Dwight, and it's a thin line telly that Dwight had... Gene Parsons himself, yep. uh, but it's the it's like the Clarence White or Marty Stewart. It is the the two body the thick w- version. Yeah, uh, Dwight. We feel like the throw is just kind of longer. It doesn't snap, and we and Dwight likes a really long, exaggerated throw. Sure. Um, so that's that should be in a museum somewhere because I don't I don't know if if Gene made a whole lot of the. I mean, he yeah. pretty pretty quickly was able to put it into a, a, a single body guitar version, yeah. obviously. So uh, I think Dwight had to kind of wear him down a little bit to, to, to get him to do what he did. Uh, you mentioned the shop that you're the Strats at. What's what's the name of the shop? Um, it's Eric's Guitar Shop. Uh, Eric Chaz. He does great, great bench work, uh, and he's in Van Nuys. He's actually where um, he's in the building that used to be uh, Sound City uh, Studios. Where they oh, made wow. a doc- it's where Nirvana made. You know, we're the rumors album and all that. Just the legendary studio. Now it's kind of been chopped up a little bit, and he's there. And, and uh, you still the, the painting's still the the sign's still on the side. It's really it's always fun to go there. Wow, that's great. Yeah, he, <laughs> he does, you know he does the work that just kind of it's just it's just kind of hard to get things certain things to do on the road. The crew, you know, you're, the crew's moving so fast, and and or now you're outdoors and you're trying to like fix something, and it's it, you know it's it's overcast. It's just you know you don't have this really controlled environment. Sure. So when we're having stuff done like this like this guitar was just bought off the wall um recently and so i i use 11s on everything uh wow. guitar stores typically have 10s yeah. so just having having that getting the intonation set just getting everything just ready to go so yeah, yeah. that's that's <laughs> that's where we that's generally where we go so did did dwight and i take my personal stuff there to him as well yeah so did dwight buy the strat or did you buy the strat uh, dwight did oh wow okay 
All right. And, um, and I mean, I have a, a couple of strats. I personally have a couple of strats. Uh, uh, but again, it's really lovely because my, my personal gear just doesn't get the wear and tear of, of being on the road. Um, it, it, it is funny because, uh, you know, at this point, the number one telly on the Dwight gig, that's the guitar I've played the most for the past 12 years in general, right? I mean, that's the guitar sure. that's in my hands the most. So uh, if I do a club gig with some friends here in LA, you know, just to get out of the house, I, I'm honestly, I'll plug in my pedal board, I'll p- turn on the amp, and if stuff lights up, I almost let, I was amazing. This is a, oh my God. I, I'm, and see, do you not do this often? Like, not with this stuff. No, I have no idea what, I, I just don't know what's going to happen with this gear. I don't, how am I supposed to, um, and you know, it's just like, oh my gosh, I got to change strings. You know, this is, this is exciting because they don't let me touch anything. Honestly, out there on the, <laughs> the, the crew, I was like, Hey, can I, and they're like, get out of here. Let's go, 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 go. You're going to ruin stuff. I was like, All right, fine. <laughs> Your home collection. What, what is that? The home collection? I mean, it, there's nothing too extravagant. I mean, it's, a, it, it's, it turns out it's a lot of tellies. Um, I've had a great relationship with Fender, obviously, yeah. um, over the years. And I worked as a, as, essentially as a spokesperson for them. For, for a good chunk of, of time there for a few years doing demonstration yeah. things. Yeah. So, gosh, I don't even know where to begin. I'll tell you what, one of the things that's really, really uh, near and dear to me is a, a 1969 Gibson LG12, a 12-string acoustic, okay. kind of a small body acoustic that I really, really love. I love the sound of it. Obviously, there's this 86 Japanese Squire Telly. That's, that's great. Um, the, 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 the guitar I use the most... In the clubs, though, is uh, not it's a telly copy that a, a guy named uh, Fred Morota down in San Diego. He uh, now has uh, he makes what's called Naked Guitars as his brand, but okay. he made this before he had his company even going. He, he had a repair shop, and it's just a it's just a, two pieces of really light swamp ash with some Seymours in it. Uh, we didn't put a finish. There's no lacquer on it. It's just a one neck. It was really built. I was playing a lot of hollow bodies at the time, okay. but traveling and they were so temperamental. Yeah. I said, I just need a fly. Guitar. I just need a guitar that I don't care about. And um, he threw this telly together for me. Uh, and uh, it became the number one guitar uh, through the Eugene Edwards band. It's just this natural grain telly that if you see a picture, that's it. It's the same one. It still gets used all the time. Wow. Um there is a I have a really great Stratocaster that that came out of the I, the custom shop kind of sideways. It's a two piece. It was supposed to be relic, but never was. So it's a two piece with a light kind of that white Mary Kay finish on it, yeah. uh, the white. And uh, but they but they put a different neck on it. So the serial numbers didn't match. They couldn't sell it. And it just they can just and I just got that because I didn't have a Strat at the time. Okay. Another cool Strat I have is a, me- a made in Mexico one. And it has the uh, David Gilmore emg harness put into it wow. so it's got the active pickups and um uh, i had a, a shop in pomona do a beautiful uh F- early 60s fiesta red finish on it uh, uh so that one's a lot of fun to play uh because it just, just looks so cool and then yeah some american vintage series tellies a, a beautiful fiesta red one i got um yeah, just that's kind of a really great cower guitar. I don't know if you know about cower. I know, Doug. It came, I, I would assume you guys know each other because of the area. Uh, just a single humbucker uh, 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 of his that just ended up my hands. And uh, that's and I love playing slide on that because I don't even know what humbucker he has on it. But it is just it's so it just kind of has that beautiful song off cushy thing yeah, and yeah. it's great for slide yeah. yeah and then amps i have a 65 uh deluxe reissue a 65 princeton reissue and um my good friend adam Grimm, who has satellite amplifiers down in san diego yep. um pretty boutiques i i met adam in the early 90s when i was around the time i met buzz and that whole rockabilly scene he was just a, a buddy, a good buddy of mine. Uh, it was long before he was he even was thinking about making amplifiers, but he started this, this company and I uh, have one of the first amps. He he actually made something for me to play in the clubs in LA because um, I had a super at the time that sometimes was just a little too much. Oh yeah. So he built me just a, a humble little looking combo, and then and then uh, it, it started. To, I started beat. It was starting to fall apart because I was being pretty rough with it. I said, "Can you repair this?" Because he had just, and then instead of repairing it, he just made a whole fresh head and speaker cabinet, this gorgeous neutron that I have. Uh, I'm really proud of that. I don't take out too much. Cause I'm, I'm I, that is one piece of gear. I'm afraid something's going to happen. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, but it cooks uh, with white on stage. Do you have pedals? Are you playing through pedals? Oh yeah. There's a pedal board. Um, and it, it just lives back by the amp. Cause I'm not really actively using my pedals. So there's, uh, uh there's two Strymon El Capitan, uh, delays. Okay. And uh, those are only running 
to the outside deluxe. So it's not running through both of them. It's just going because that's something that Pete did. He he would run an Echoplex, but only on the 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 amp that was uh, far stage ride, I guess. And sure. Pete's because uh, Pete was on this. Uh, on that side. Side anyway, so there's a slapback delay that's running pretty much on all the songs, except for Thousand Miles. It's a longer delay uh-huh. to kind of give a, a bit of a chorus effect like the record does. Uh, so we have that. There's, you know, for Tremolo, there's just that yellow uh, Dan Electro. Che- oh, wow. Che- <laughs> <laughs> What's the, is it the tuna? I don't even know what it's called. Um, we have that. I, I have a little tuner um, for spot check stuff. There's an EP booster. Uh, which we threw on there only because we were doing a Guitar Center Sessions uh, in that room. It's pretty tough to get a good sound because it's a really dead padded room. Yeah. Um, and we were and Dwight just couldn't hear my leads well. And so we were guitar and said, well, let's get a let's get a clean boost pedal. So someone ran upstairs, grabbed it, put it at 12 o'clock, threw it down there. And just it's stayed on the board since then. Wow. Um, so only if I get only if I get too excited, do I ever step on that? And then just just channel switchers after that. I mean, it's just because of the, the three amps. Sure, but, sure. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean. Yeah, there's not. We're not really using any. Obviously, we're not using any effects for tone. It's really, it's really the guitar is straight into the amp. Is is, uh, is what we're doing for that. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad we had that opportunity to make this happen, and and it's. Uh, this is taking forever. I'm so sorry. Yeah, but I'm glad you, I'm glad it happened. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if the sol- show is sold out in Napa, but I'm gonna try to get in. So, I'll. I'll... Well, if, I'll tell you what. Just uh, send me an email later tonight, and I'll make sure you get there. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. That. Thank you very much. Of course. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. And safe travels. I ho- I wish you well on picking up your Strat. And I look forward to seeing it on, on uh, Yes, sir. No, my social. On Sunday. My social media guy said, I have to get a picture of the interview. I said, I don't know how to do that. He said, we'll take a picture of the, but then the, the picture is going to be of, I, if, how do I take a screenshot? But then the picture is going to be me reaching. The, I got my kid yelling at me. Anyway, <laughs> close enough. I got it close enough. We'll okay, have good. to make do in this content age. Well, hopefully when, when the Dwight's album comes out later this year, hopefully we'll get a little, uh, we'll get a blurb or a little, a little a page or so i'll you oh, know yeah. i'll talk to johnny maybe johnny will, will give me a call and we'll talk about that stuff but a yeah. lot of guitars a lot of guitar work on this well, record. we can we can do a second interview and and oh i'm never done talking about guitars so okay, if good. you're if you get stuck it's like i i, I you know like someone a guest fell off and like give me a call because i never shut up about the stuff and i should say that i'm a huge fan of your i think you're still doing the the uh, jukebox show oh the jukebox graduate yeah you know i don't do that show with dave anymore but but I do have my own weekly hour long and it's called the know it all hour. Okay. And so, uh, and so if you, if you follow me on socials, any of my social, you'll, I'm always doing promos for the know it all hour. And uh, in fact, this week's show uh, for guitar players out there, uh, they can always go back to episode 134. Uh, last weekend, uh, we played Friday night in Shreveport, okay. Louisiana, which is great, except every time we play in Shreveport, James Burton comes to hang out oh, and wow. watch the whole show. Wow. And, he, and so I've got to play telly with James Burton right over there. Right. So everyone's excited to see James Burton except for me <laughs> at this point. Now, I've met James years ago in the night. He's the nicest man. He's been so – but come on. <laughs> this is not fair. Yeah. Then the next night we played a festival and Los Lobos played ahead of us. Oh, wow. So my, my ultimate hero, David H- Hidalgo, uh-huh. yeah. I got to follow that too. And I'm – I'm always tongue tied around him. I I don't. I'm just not the same person. It, it was a rough weekend. So this week's radio show is about those experiences. I do a deep dive on James Burton and I talk about the David Hilago experience. So uh, <laughs> yeah. So well, it's it's great. it's a good one for guitar players. Yeah, I'll check. I'll check it out for sure. All right, buddy. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye. Yeah. Take it easy, bud. <laughs> See you Sunday. Thanks for listening to Have Guitar Will Travel. You can catch up on all the things I'm doing at thedeadlies.com. And I'm on all the social media platforms as well. And please support Vintage Guitar and all the wonderful things they do because they do many, many wonderful things for us guitar players. Thanks. Please subscribe. Please tell a friend. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye, guys.